All right, well, thank you for joining us today. My name is Matt Murphy. I'm the executive director of the NYU Furman Center. Uh, for those of you who are unaware with our work, uh, we advance research and debate on housing, neighborhoods, and urban policy. Uh, today's discussion, I think, is an excellent example of how we operate at this intersection. We're here today to further understand and discuss insights into the proposed changes to the Community Reinvestment Act. Uh, some of you will not have heard about CRA, as you'll hear it referred to today, and some of you are some of the true experts on it. Um, but all, of course, are welcome uh, to today's conversation, and our goal is that you're walking out of here with some more knowledge than you came in with. Today's topic reminds us that there are underlying directives that guide investments into New York City neighborhoods. When these key principles change, or are proposed to change, we expect the implications to be tremendous. As such, the merits of these changes need to be fully understood and debated as we all work collectively to shape our city's future. So we selected today's topic and panel discussion to develop a deeper understanding of the CRA and what effect these proposed changes um, well, may have on our city and also our, our country. I don't think that we have a better panel actually to have this discussion. Um, so, uh, we have an amazing moderator, Mark Willis, who I'll welcome to the stage in a moment. Uh, Mark is our senior policy fellow at the Furman Center, an economist by training. Uh, Mark has really seen the CRA operate at every angle, having worked in local government, the Federal Reserve Bank, J.P. Morgan Chase, and running a community development group there for 19 years. Um, he also sits about on just about every nonprofit board in New York City. <laughs> so with that, please join me in welcoming Mark Willis. Thank you, Matt. Um, we have a lot to cover this morning, so I'm going to uh, launch in here uh, pretty quickly. At the end, we will uh, open for questions. You have cards, so please uh, fill out those cards if you have some questions you want to ask um, to the group. Uh, for those of you who uh, are worried about your national standing, we are live streaming this, so uh, it's quite possible that people uh, across the country are watching this because we did get some publicity for it. So uh, this is a great opportunity, I think, for us to air these very, very important issues uh, that have been raised uh, by the proposed changes. So I'm going to do a quick introduction here to the topic. Um, as Matt said, I think many of you know a fair amount about this, but um, I want to make sure that uh, we have some sort of basic information uh, to start our, uh, the, uh, the panel. So um, the first slide uh, is a little graphic, uh, and it just makes the very simple point that in 1977, uh, there was concern about redlining. And uh, <clears throat> on the left-hand side, you see that there were instances where banks were in communities taking deposits from those communities, but not reinvesting there. Uh, most of their money was going elsewhere in the country. And the whole idea of CRA was to make sure that those deposit dollars were reinvested in the community. Um, and just as a kind of a fun fact here, it may shock some of you to know that back then, there were actually, in Illinois, banks didn't even have branches. So you could only have one bank. Uh, and that became uh, an important issue with South Shore Bank and other banks uh, there. But, uh, I guess that also makes the point, which I'll make again, that the industry has changed a great deal. The idea here, if you reinvest in the community, the community is going to do better. Uh, so um, uh, that's what you see on the, the right-hand side. Uh, the Community uh, Rein, uh, Reinvestment Act uh, is enforced by the three bank regulators, the OCC, the FDIC, and the Fed. Um, and they uh, rate banks, they, they examine them periodically and rate them from outstanding to satisfactory, needs to improve a substantial noncompliance. And if they get one of those last two grades, uh, there are some uh, penalties uh, for them. It's more difficult for them to merge or open branches, uh, get permission to, to do those. Uh, the uh, National Community Reinvestment Coalition has put out a number. I just give you a sense of order of magnitude. Just wanted to show you here of two trillion dollars um, in investments that they have been able to uh, uh, to follow and record uh, over the period from 19, um, uh, 1977 when the act was uh, uh, 
enacted by, by Congress. Uh, the, the way the, the act is implemented is through regulations, uh, exam guidelines, and Q&As. I'm not going to get into much detail, but the important point to realize at, at this point is that um, the regulations were last went through a major reform, uh, a rewrite in 1995. And, and many things have changed uh, in the bank, banking industry. And so the banking industry, uh, the regulators have been thinking about um, uh, updating the regulations. Sometimes we have the word modernization. I, I sometimes hesitate to use it. It sounds a little bit more dramatic maybe than what's necessary. But there have been changes. There's been interstate banking, and now most recently uh, we have um, internet banking. So in July of 2010, the regulators uh, held hearings across the country, uh, and uh, regulations were supposed to be uh, changed very quickly after that. Uh, we never uh, saw them. It turned out to be very difficult for the three regulatory agencies to do something. Uh, uh, in the, more recently, the, uh, Joseph Otting, the control of the currency, decided he would take on this task. Uh, he views it as something that uh, no one else has been able to do, and he is going to uh, make something happen here. So in August of 2018, he issued uh, the advance notice of proposed rulemaking uh, and got a lot of comments then. And then in this past December, he issued a uh, uh, notice of proposed rulemaking. Uh, the uh, comments need to be in by April 8th. That's a 30-day extension from the original uh, piece. The critical thing to realize is, uh, quite unusually, the, uh, all three bank regulators could not agree and the Fed has uh, uh, not gone along with the NPR. Uh, they say they're willing to see what happens. Uh, as I said, uh, uh, they, they would review the comments from the AMPR. Uh, but at this point, uh, they are not, uh, not on, on board. And, and we'll talk a little bit about the implications uh, of that. So um, banks are evaluated uh, basically on a CRA performance basically in what's called assessment areas, and these are the areas ser served by their deposit-taking branches. So as that original uh, diagram showed, you look uh, where the bank's taking deposits, and you look at what CRA activity is around those, uh, those areas, uh, and that's what they uh, evaluate. It turns out some banks uh, don't take deposits, uh, something called wholesale limited purpose banks, uh, or they at least don't have a physical uh, deposit-taking facility. Uh, and in that case, uh, the, the main office of the bank is, is treated as an assessment area, or uh, the area around the main office. So uh, ratings are uh, f overall for bank, uh, and, uh, but they also are rated at for all of their multi-state metro areas. Uh, so like the New York region, uh, banks that are here get rated uh, on their CRA performance in the metro area, and also um, there are state ratings. Uh, so there's a whole hierarchy um, uh, of, uh, of rating here. So the OCC has put out what he, they uh, uh, thought was, uh, was motivated, what they wanted to point out was motivating their uh, efforts and reform. So these are the key points from them about uh, lack of predictability, transparency, and clarity. Banks have, and we'll hear a little bit more about this, have often said they would like more of, of that. Um, so that was one of uh, his goals. Uh, there's concern, or there has been concern, that examiners have too much discretion and training of examiners. So he uh, wants to, uh, and this is the flip side of uh, uh, predictability, uh, wants to uh, limit examiner discretion. Uh, there's also, with three examiners, they all uh, seem to look at the, uh, the regs in different ways. Uh, so we want to uh, overcome that problem of inconsistent interpretations. Uh, and uh, there has been some question about uncertainty uh, about what actors qualify under CRA. Often a bank doesn't learn what qualifies until the exam many years later after whatever activity they have undertaken. Um, so in the, the last is, um, this whole idea of modernization and dealing with uh, uh, the, the internet, uh, um, internet banking. So uh, the regs don't explicitly deal with that, and uh, the intention of the new ones is uh, to make, again, uh, very clear rules with regard to that. So th there have been uh, 
uh, as a result of this, there are proposed rule changes. Um, uh, there are uh, in four categories put here. We'll talk a little bit more about each of them. One is revamp the method of measuring a bank's CRA activity. The second is delineate qualifying activities in more detail, expands where activities count, and increases collection and maintenance of the data. So let's look uh, first at the revamp, the method of measuring banks' activities. So what we have now is three major changes. There's a new CRA evaluation measure. That's the official name of it. There is a, a change in the way the retail lending test is done, um, and we've added a, a community development uh, minimum uh, threshold. So um, you can see that in more detail here. So under the current system, there are three uh, uh, major tests uh, for a large retail bank. One is the lending test, which looks at their mortgage lending, small business lending, something that now is sometimes called retail lending. Uh, and that, you get a rating for that, that counts 50%. Then an investment test, uh, there for those of you who are familiar with low income housing tax credits, a, a common way of meeting the investment test. That's a, a separate test for 25% of uh, weight. And the services test talks about retail services, uh, branches, products, and um, uh, community development services. Banks get a separate rating on each one of them, but if they do really well on one, it can help compensate for doing less well on another. So all three of these are then added together, um, and uh, uh, if you do really well, as I said, uh, it can, uh, on one, it helps overall for the other. <clears throat> the proposal replaces this completely. Uh, so um, it comes up with what's called, as I said, the CRA, evaluation measure, it is simply a ratio, dollars in the numerator, dollars in the denominator. So the dollars in the numerator are dollars of qualifying activities, uh, uh, and the denominator is a measure of the size of the, uh, of the bank. In this case, uh, they're using domestic retail uh, deposits. So just to make it clear here, there's nothing about impact, there's nothing about relative performance in lending, investment, uh, and services tests. Uh, if you did a $40 million stadium, uh, one of the more controversial uh, aspects of this uh, thing, and this proposal, uh, and you do a $1 million small business loan, the stadium gets 400 times the credit that the small business uh, loan gets. So uh, by putting it all together and making it all just simple dollars, then obviously you get a lot more bang for your buck if you do very large projects. Um, and we'll talk about what possible implications this is for the smaller stuff. It also doesn't take at all into account the, the impact uh, in the community. So it does turn out that stadiums could get some credit in some limited ways, but it was up to the examiner to say how much uh, credit to give. So if they thought that that stadium was having a lot of impact on the neighborhood and it was very hard to do, they probably would give more weight to it. Under the new system, everything gets the same weight. It's just uh, based, on, uh, based on dollars. Uh, the next area uh, in the revamp of the method for measuring CRA performance is the retail lending test. Uh, the measure here is there's a benchmark of um, the easiest one to understand is how's the bank doing lending to, uh, uh, let's say, mortgages to low and moderate income uh, borrowers compared to what the overall market is. So if 10% of the metro market is low and moderate income, mortgages to low and moderate income, and the bank does 10%, that's a good thing. If it does a little bit more, maybe that's a better thing. If it does less, uh, all right, it uh, uh, obviously would not get a, a, as, high, as high marks for that particular uh, test. But now this test has been turned into a pure pass-fail. So you either make it or you don't make it. And if you don't make it, your, the assessment area uh, fails. Uh, it's a CRA um, uh, test. Uh, because it's pass-fail, in part, it, the threshold for doing that is uh, uh, looking at the benchmarks. You only have to hit 65% or 55% of that uh, 
a benchmark. So uh, by turning into a pass-fail, it's created a totally different dynamic than existed before. Um, again, I don't know if we get comment on it, but a lot of banks are worried that all they have to do is miss this, uh, and uh, uh, an, their assessment, that particular assessment area will fail uh, the test. Uh, there's also now um, a minimum amount of community development lending. It's got to be 2% of that uh, uh, domestic retail uh, deposits. Uh, so now we've, we've turned into what I describe here as a, a, a check the box situation. So banks are going to just try and figure out how do I get over that, uh, that threshold. Uh, and uh, from my point of view, not clear that they will care about what impact they're having on the community. All they care is whether they uh, meet the test. The next uh, uh, thing is delineating qualifying activities in more details. Uh, the, the proposed regs have a very long list of uh, qualifying activities. It has one uh, innovation which I have uh, uh, long thought uh, was would be helpful, and that is that there will be a possibility for banks to go get pre-approval. So if they see a project and they want to know if it's going to qualify for CRA, they don't have to wait till the exam to find out whether it really did, but they will be able to uh, talk to their regulator uh, uh, to do that. Um, and it has this uh, other aspect, I don't know if we'll talk very much, uh, about a pro rata credit. So you can get credit for things that are, serve both low income areas are households and non, and then you would get some uh, ratio of credit for, uh, for, for those activities. Uh, it also has expanded the types of qualifying activities. So if you're in an opportunity zone uh, and it's in a low and moderate income neighborhood, which most of them are, then uh, it automatically qualifies. All family farms, up to 10 million, qualify. A whole new category called consumer loans. Consumer loans like credit cards were optional before, now they are um, uh, mandatory uh, for you to be examined on your performance there. Um, and it has increased the, the maximum size of small business loans from one million uh, to two million, also small farm loans. Uh, next is, uh, it expands where uh, activities count. So we talked about uh, assessment areas where you take deposits. Those are now called facility-based assessment areas. And in order to kind of uh, start to, I think, uh, deal with this internet business, if more than 50% of your business is outside your assessment areas, your retail business, uh, then um, any area where at least 5% of your deposits come from, you, uh, the bank's deposits come from, uh, will be designated uh, as, a, as an assessment area. Next is increases collection and maintenance of data. Uh, probably if you were in the weeds, you realize a few things I've mentioned. We don't even have any data on that, like consumer loans. There's a huge increase in, in what the data requirements are here. Um, you need much more detail because you're going to have to figure out where, now you have to figure out where deposits are coming from, what's the address of the depositor, which wasn't uh, considered before, uh, the dollar amount and number of qualifying activities by location. <laughs> It's now based on balance sheet. I don't think we'll get into this, but the highly technical, but a, a very dramatic change. So that if I, um, before, I, uh, as a bank, you had to originate loans uh, in, uh, during the exam period in order to get credit for them. Now, if your balance sheet at the beginning of the exam period and the end is the same as it was for the previous exam period, you literally don't have to uh, originate any community development loans. You do need to do. Uh, mortgages and, and small business loans and, and consumer loans. So you have to do retail, but on the community development side, uh, you literally wouldn't have to do any more uh, as long as your balance sheet hadn't changed in terms of the size of the community development. Uh, very interesting here. Obviously, the, uh, um, I didn't mention before, and I should have, for the CRA evaluation measure, if you uh, get 11%, if you hit that, you're going to get an outstanding 6% uh, satisfactory, so that ratio is just going to, there are steps in there, and um, depending on where you are with your ratio will determine uh, what you, uh, uh, what rating, uh, what rating you get. Interestingly enough, no one has the data. So uh, the OCC has 
issued a request for information that actually is part of writing these rules. They're now asking for the data they would need to see whether 6%, 11%, those, those numbers uh, even uh, uh, make sense. So we'll talk a little bit about, uh, I think, about the complications for, for banks. So that's my quick introductions. Probably it went on a little bit longer than I should have. Uh, but hopefully this gives you a sense of uh, what, uh, what we're looking at now. And uh, now I'd like to call up the panel. Uh, as uh, Matt said, we have just a great panel. I'm not going to, you have their, their bio, so I'm just going to uh, mention them as they come up. So uh, Hope Knight uh, is the president and CEO of Greater Jamaica Development Corporation. Jennifer Vasiloff is Chief External Affairs Officer for Opportunity Finance Network, which is the trade association for community development financial institutions. Jamie Weisberg is our own local leader here uh, on uh, a lot of this. She's a senior campaign analyst for the Association for Neighborhood and Housing D Development, ANHD. Um, and Buzz Roberts, who uh, is the president and CEO of the National Association of Affordable Housing Lenders, and they are a lot of the large banks and also a lot of uh, CDFIs and, uh, and large uh, not-for-profits are also part of the organization. So uh, welcome uh, to all of you. Thank you for uh, being here and, and, uh, and helping us. So uh, I'm going to launch right in here to uh, uh, the topic. So before we talk about the regs uh, and what its impact is, why don't we uh, talk a little bit about uh, what what you think CRA has done? What's the value of CRA? Do we really have to care here if uh, the world has changed? And uh, um, hope I'll probably start with you many times, and you can just refuse sometimes. So why don't we just go down the line, sure. and uh, we can uh, break it up a little bit. So thank you, Mark, and I'm so appreciative that you're having this forum. It's very timely. <laughs> so as you know, I have uh, worked in underserved communities for the past two decades. First in Upper Manhattan, and now in Jamaica. And um, I'll talk about Jamaica specifically. Uh, Jamaica is one of these places, not unlike other urban centers around the country, where there was uh, tremendous disinvestment um, 50 years ago. And uh, the disinvestment continued. And the organization that I run was formed to really try to stem that disinvestment. And it worked for decades to attract private investment to the community. And, um, you know, we, we had the, uh, the fortunate opportunity to have investment, private investment happen uh, in a major way about five years ago. And, um, you know, it's always what private investor is going to go first mm -hmm. in a community, um, who's going to make that first investment, even in spite of uh, dollars being CRA eligible. And so I say that to say that uh, CRA dollars are critical to the work that I have done. And, um, you know, uh, communities go through uh, cycles and evolution, and the same kinds of investments that are needed today are not going to be needed, uh, you know, in 10 years, but they will still need investment yeah. mm -hmm. to create uh, some um, equity for that right. community. Great, right. Jamie, CRA motivated uh, investments in, in lending? Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, my name. NHD has a deep respect for the Community Reinvestment Act. Um, every year we do a study and we do our best to document what's happening in New York City. And New York are over $10 billion in reinvestment every year for at least the past five or six years that I've been tracking this. Um, and these are investments big and small. Our members are nonprofit developers, CDCs, community organizations. Throughout the city in the past 40 years, we estimate about 330,000 units of affordable housing have been built and roughly a third of that by nonprofit developers. And none of that would be built without some form of financing from the private sector, be it grants, loans, investments, directly to the organizations or through the city or, you know, this is how we leverage our public dollars, right? Um, it has also resulted in CRA plans and relationships with our community organizations that has led to products and practices um, could be new bank branches, could be a new checking account, could be um, an investment in a nonprofit to build affordable housing or to create new manufacturing space. Um, so CRA has allowed us to encourage banks and to get banks to commit to better multifamily practices. That would not have happened without the CRA. So 
we could talk at length about the ways that it needs to be improved, but we have to absolutely acknowledge what it has done and continues to do so that we maintain what works as we think about what we want to do to make it stronger. Great, Jamie. Buzz, I know you've done some analysis too, also of the impact. Uh, maybe you want to talk a briefly about some of that data? Yes, yeah, so um, we commissioned the Urban Institute to do some research on community development lending uh, data because um, we felt like uh, having a, a, a feel for what's go what has been going on with CRA would be important to uh, understanding what direction modernization should go and uh, really be a touchstone for uh, evaluating the effectiveness of modernization. And just uh, to give you a sense of numbers, uh, in 2016, uh, CRA lending by banks was uh, something over 300, uh, $300 billion. It's a lot of money. Uh, and uh, interestingly, and we didn't know this really until we did this research, that splits about evenly among home mortgage lending, small business lending, and community development lending. Um, I have been in the community development world uh, for many, many years, uh, and um, I did not realize the extent of community development lending under uh, CRA. We don't have data on community development investments because um, uh, the agencies do either don't collect it in, in a consolidated way or they certainly don't report it. Uh, so there's a lot more also uh, on the community development side in the form of investments. Uh, but aside from the numbers, I think it's important to recognize that uh, CRA is really the oxygen that community development breathes. That the entire public policy apparatus of community development is built on the foundation of private capital uh, uh, through CRA. And uh, pulling CRA out of community development will uh, undermine all the public policies from low-income housing tax credits to the HUD programs like uh, the Home Investment Partnerships Program to CDFIs and many other uh, public policies that have helped stabilize and revitalize communities. And, um, and that's really what's at stake here. Thank you, Buzz. CDFIs. Um, we, we also have a big stake in um, the future of CRA, um, community development financial institutions, CDFIs, uh, our mission lenders um, operating in the same low and moderate income communities um, that it, uh, is the focus of, of, of CRA. Um, we uh, partner with mainstream banks and borrow about half of the capital that we then on lend to um, uh, community uh, projects from CRA motivated banks. And so just from you know, the ability to do the work that we do with you know, usually much smaller deals, um, uh, a lot of deals that um, are, are, are less attractive to mainstream financial institutions are, are made possible by the partnerships that we have with um, CRA motivated um, uh, mainstream banks. Okay, thank you. So uh, <clears throat> move us along uh, here. I'm going to do two quick lightning rounds. So uh, you only get a few words here because this first question, I'm sure, uh, will get a, uh, it could get very extensive here. But let's get a top line view on what's your overall assessment of the proposal. Generally bad. <laughs> OK. Do you Jane? want to say more? That's no? it. <laughs> That's as top line as you can be. <laughs> I'll bring in my improv skill. Yes, and. <laughs> um, I echo that. Um, but delving in a little bit further, um, despite the stated goals of the CRA reform from the Comptroller, I think this proposal is more complicated, less transparent, and will lead to less investment. And we can debate about the dollars, but it will certainly be less meaningful investment. That we can say. That we are certain about. And that is not the certainty that I want in CRA. Um, the one met ratio metric rewards larger investments over smaller, more impactful deals. It doesn't look at that. It reduces or eliminates any emphasis on branches. 
It allows for way more activities to count for CRA credit, which go beyond the spirit of the law and possibly the statute. I'll let the lawyers weave that one out. Um, there's still no way to downgrade banks for displacement, which is something we've been struggling with for a long time, and it reduces the local obligation. So those are our top level concerns with this, and I know we'll have time to go into more detail. Right. Buzz? I think it's a tremendously missed opportunity. Uh, CRA needs modernization. The last time we had uh, <coughs> a, a real policy change was in 1995. That's 25 years ago. A lot has changed in the banking world and in communities and in the practice of uh, reinvestment. Uh, and, and so there is a real opportunity to uh, get, move CRA more in alignment to where uh, the world is now and where it's going. But um, it's a missed opportunity because in, instead of taking a look at the house of CRA and saying, yeah, you know, this house needs a kitchen upgrade and, and maybe um, a, a master bath, and instead has said, oh, let's just demolish the house <laughs> and uh, build a new house. Um, and, and that really uh, is where we are. I agree with my colleagues, um, and uh, I also want to sort of go back to something that Mark said in his introduction, which I think is, is worth underlining, which is how the proposed rule sort of changes the incentives um, and changes the, uh, you know, sort of what is measured, and, um, and we're all sort of uh, guessing how that's going to influence bank behavior, um, and I think that those uncertainties and those unknowns and the, the but the worry that if you are, are looking, uh, if you're rewarding different kinds of behaviors or measuring different kinds of um, uh, outputs, um, you know, what are you going to end up with? I mean, that, that, that's another concern. Okay, so another lightning round here. So we saw what OCC uh, thought was the, its principles. Uh, Jamie, I think you questioned whether they accomplished the ones that they uh, stated. So maybe you'd like to just go very quickly here about what you think the key goals of this ought to be? No, I'm, I'm, I'm giving Hope a little room. Oh, no, I'm looking at Hope because she's right. part of our team and helped develop these, so sorry. That's, what, that's why we're whispering yeah. here. Um, <laughs> not to, not to yeah. sidetrack Do you think Jamie can handle this, Hope? I do. <laughs> All right, okay. All right. So we actually have a committee that's working on CRA, and it's been working on this for a number of years, and we're Greater Jamaica is a really key partner on that. Um, but our members came up with priorities, and so this is what drives what we are fighting for when we think about what we want in reform. So top level, banks should be evaluated on the quantity, quality, and impact of their activities within the local communities they served. So like what you were saying around the types of investment may change, but we know we'll need investment. Um, so incentivizing high quality, responsive activities for historically redlined people and communities, and downgrades for banks that are financing activities that cause harm and displacement. Two, community input and community needs must be at the heart of the CRA. And three, assessment areas must maintain the local obligation. Whatever jargon you want to put on it, we need that local obligation that really creates and fosters partnerships. And the need to serve, whether you partner or not, that you have to serve the local community where you are. And we can have a thousand debates about what that means, but we know what it means to our city today and how it can be stronger. Uh, so what we really need from the current system is better clarity and consistency, particularly around what counts and where it counts. Uh, it's so frustrating to have a really cool project uh, to do and to have banks and uh, the, their, their clients, uh, whether it's a CDFI or anyone else, uh, want to do it. Uh, but having no clarity from the regulators whether it will count. And the power of CRA is that banks do things that they otherwise would not do because of CRA. So embedded in that concept is the idea that you're going to get credit for doing good stuff. And if you don't know, or if it depends on who your individual examiner is, uh, and if that examiner you're talking to today about the deal you want to do tomorrow isn't going to be the same examiner that actually comes in 
and evaluates your performance two or three years from now, um, that causes banks to uh, seize up and uh, say, you know what, we, we really have so many uh, uh, metrics and goals that we have to manage. Think of a bank that may have 100 local markets or 200 local markets and multiple uh, targets for each of those markets. And here comes a really cool looking deal, but the bank can't tell if it'll count. The rational bank is gonna say, you know what? I think we should focus on the things we know will count um, rather than the things that might or might not count. And banks have been burned by this so many times that they're understandably shy. That is uh, something that's totally fixable um, without uh, this uh, total overhaul. <laughs> right. Okay, Jennifer? Um, I think that it's, it's useful to um, you know, sort of note at least once this morning that um, in a conversation about changes to the regs, um, there are certain issues that are sort of off the table that would require changes in the actual law, um, which, you know, again, was 1977, and a lot of things um, have, have changed, certainly in community development um, and in the banking industry uh, more broadly, that um, uh, my organization, I think a lot of others, would really like to get a, a, a crack at. Um, I think that there are... Um, you know, sort of CRA deserts or um, less populated uh, parts of the country that have um, you know, next to no chance of, of attracting CRA motivated investments. Um, this is true in a lot of rural areas in Indian country and um, uh, you know, sort of despite of some, some, some language in the uh, OCC FDIC proposal um, you know, it's just really, I, I don't think, going to be able to get at that problem. Um, and and it might not be possible to get at it in a meaningful way, um, you know, solely through a, a change in the, in the regulations. So I I'm, um, want to just add a piece here, and I'm going to turn this into a, a, a question here. Uh, we're talking about banks doing things mm -hmm. that they would not normally do. Um, but banks are required to be safe and sound. Mm -hmm. So what is it that allows them to do something special? Why do they have that capability here? Um, and is that part of what might be in danger um, uh, with, with this change? I see Buzz uh, nodding here, so I think you understand my question. Yeah, so, um, you know, the first two things you got to do is uh, manage risk and, uh, uh, and, and manage uh, uh, the, the quality of, of, of the activity, the rate of return you're getting. I, I think those, you can manage risk and you can manage rate of return and still do great community reinvestment. But it might, um, it might require some real specialized uh, uh, staff to understand the neighborhoods, to understand uh, the interaction with public policies. Uh, and the deals may be higher touch. And uh, that is something that would not normally uh, happen unless there was some motivation to do it. CRA provides the motivation to take the time, uh, do the high touch deals that really have impact and uh, they can be done with great safety and soundness. Uh, Mark mentioned the low-income housing tax credit before. Um, the foreclosure rate cumulatively on low-income housing tax credits, and they've been around for over 30 years, uh, is less than 1%, cumulative foreclosure rate. That is the highest performing asset class in real estate, period, full stop. So, Risk can be managed here. That's really not the issue. And the banks have staffed up to do that, just to bring that full yeah. circle. Right? They have specialized staff mm -hmm. that, that work on that. So I'm not, I'm not sure I'm going to get much uh, <clears throat> response here, but does anybody want to point out any other aspects of what they think is uh, positive about the, uh, the regs here that is 
the so pre-approval obviously is a huge yeah. piece yeah. here. Yeah. Um, are there other pieces we, we should highlight? I would just double down on the transparency uh, uh, issue of um, having a list of CRA eligible activities and then the process for identifying new ones that, that Mark um, uh, recognized. Um, I have to admit in December when this first came out and all of us were sort of, you know, trying to speed real, read 200 and whatever um, pages. Um, it was just real. <laughs> Um, it was really welcome to, uh, you know, sort of go down the list and it's like, ooh, CDFIs are mentioned. We're never mentioned. Um, <laughs> isn't this great? Um, you know, then, then the reality sits in that, um, well, you know, CDFI activity is, in, is on the same list as these much bigger deals and other less focused um, uh, on low and moderate income folks. Um, kinds of activities, but it, it was still sort of really refreshing to, you know, see the list. And so I think that um, if I had to identify one thing that um, uh, was, was welcome about the, the, this proposal, I, it would probably be that one. That's good. Jamie? So I was the one that pushed back on Mark when he said he was going to ask this question, so I feel like I was challenged to, to answer <laughs> it with integrity. Um, <laughs> I was like, there's nothing good. But um, <laughs> the problem is, the bad so outweighs the good. But if we're going to talk about nuance and detail, um, I'm not opposed to clarity, right? I'm not clear on what the deals are that aren't getting credit, but I think that's a fine conversation to have, particularly if a local group is saying, we need this, right? Um, on its face, you know, extra credit for CDFIs, presuming that you actually look at what's being done, right? But having an additional consideration for CDFIs seems like a positive thing, right? Um, or it is a positive thing. But as you pointed out, you know, your $40 million stadium right. will outweigh, uh, you know, a $2 million or your double credit $4 million to a CDFI, and even that's a large loan, right? Um, we do want more data available. I don't know that this is going to give me the data that I would want to evaluate it, honestly. It didn't have, like, a Humda-like database that I could go through, so I'm not clear of the data here. Humda, I'm sure everybody knows Home, the home Mortgage, mortgage Disclosure, Disclosure Act, Act yeah. is mortgage data. Um, they're trying... I guess, I feel like I'm quoting all my colleagues, but it missed opportunity, right? So dealing with internet banks, laudable goal, like please look at that. But rather than look at the research that, you know, Furman put out, that NCRC put out, they just threw out some random target and didn't even take it seriously. They're not taking it seriously is what they're doing. They're not taking this seriously at all, and it's really problematic. I've been frustrated not just wholesale banks, but limited purpose banks are not evaluated on the limited purpose that they have, like credit card banks. They are only evaluated on community development activities. So name your, you know, American Express, Discover, Capital One, Chase, they all have credit card banks. They can choose to put their small business lending on their large bank test or not. It's their choice. And there's no analysis of the credit cards. Does that mean that I want you all to race to make credit card loans to LMI borrowers? Probably not. Just to be um, clear, it, but they're adding have, consumer loans. Right, but I'm saying, so, so then, adding it is right. not a terrible thing, but the way that they're doing it is hugely problematic. Right. So rather than take it seriously and say, right. let's look at what the impact of your credit card loans are, good, bad, and otherwise, they just said, lump them all in there, now you get credit. So that's why even like the, the You go into steps, the numerator, that's right. Yeah. Right, but mm -hmm. so I think it's fine. Like I was glad to see the banks all be evaluated on right. their products, but this isn't a real evaluation. So um, those are the, the positives that, that I could come up with. That's your positive, right? <laughs> and, uh, and, and even patient capital, right? Uh, like, I know that there are so groups that say, oh, it's really frustrating. I have to renew my loan every three years, whereas an investment stays on the right. books. But rather than model it after what they do today, where they say, OK, what investments did you right. make? And what investments right. do you have on the book? Right. They said, oh, well, let's just put everything on the book so you can make one large investment alone, and you're good for the next 20 years. That's more patient than we need, right. and it leaves out other people. So right. they're just, they're not, they're taking random bits of information and then right. just making a proposal out of it. I'm going to decode that just a little bit. So <laughs> uh, you, you have uh, uh, um, an exam every three years, and so yeah. you had to make investments during that three year period. Um, so banks would make a three year, let's say, um, uh, deposit um, mm -hmm. in a bank, and then it'd have to be renewed, and that was driving everybody crazy. So. Now you don't have to right. do that, so there's some logic to saying we didn't want the regulations to, de to determine right. this continued renewal, but on the other hand, what have we got with it? And right. in changing everything to a balance sheet right. me measure. But we so. Exactly, and we actually have a model on CRA today that 
that works okay, right? We certainly want banks to make new investments, and I want to make sure they look at both your new investments and ones you have on the books, but it allows you to have an investment that's for 10 years, right? Like a lot of tech investment not, is not going to end in three years. But rather than have that model for loans, they just said, you know, they went completely in the other direction. So I think probably in the communities you've been in, I hope uh, branches are important. Does have branches, bank branches? Branches are important. Uh, I didn't uh, go into detail, and I can hear how it changed, but if you want to explain how branches are dealt with and what you think might be the impact? Uh, well, let me just talk about Jamaica for a second. That's perfect. I think that um, it's a good example. Um, so, you know, if you leave the downtown and you go into communities, highly dense uh, communities in Southeast Queens, you will go through large swaths of geography without any bank branches. And what you will see is uh, a number of cash, check cashing stores, and bodegas that have high cost uh, ATMs in them. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, even in this context, um, there's still not enough frank branches in um, Southeast Queens. And I would imagine that if we were to move to um, the proposals, that um, there would be less of an inclination to site branches in the geography. Yeah, I left it out. So the, the branches, the share of your branches that are an LMI get um, multiplied by a very small number and they can get added to your ratio. So if your uh, uh, CRA, other CRA activities is 10%, you might be able to get up to 11 by doing it. But again, it doesn't pay any attention to where the LMI branches are. So you literally could close all the LMI branches in Jamaica yes. and still be Okay, we're now, yeah. um, the branches are evaluated under the service test uh, in each assessment area separately. Mm -hmm. So, um, And they also took out any analysis of mode of service. So under the current exam, they look at, you know, are your hours different, right? Are you closing at four in an LMI track and up until eight in an upper income track? Or they talk about alternative delivery services. Right. Um, and even in the latest round of Q&A, which is a document that banks use to go into more depth on the regulations, this question and answer document, they added more um, analysis of products offered and if you're using them, which is a huge step forward. You'll now see on exams, they offered an affordable mortgage or this you know, check, affordable checking, and they opened up 200 accounts. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of analysis that I would want to see on CRA exams. And that is actually eliminated entirely. They like, took it out. Like there's just, not, it's not even, is it good or bad? It's gone. Other comments on the evaluation measure? Oh, where do we start? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we're going to end in two minutes, so <laughs> maybe I should point that out. Uh, so, at least um, on this topic. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I, I will try to contain myself. But um, <laughs> thank you. first is just to reiterate. <laughs> um, a couple of points that have already been made but that are really important. Uh, there needs to be a balanced focus, not just on quantity of activity, but the quality and responsiveness of the activity. That's missing here. Um, second is it drives um, a rational, business-minded bank uh, in the wrong direction because it says what, a, a bank manager will say, what is the fastest, easiest, uh, way to hit my dollar target, my quota. How do I get there the fastest and easiest way? Oh, and by the way, how do I do it in a way that uh, ties up as little capital as possible? And that is just a totally different question from what a community's needs and how well are we serving them. Mm -hmm. So that's the basic thing. Mm -hmm. Second is, and maybe we'll get into this further below, there's just no basis in data for the targets that they have set. Um, we don't know whether these percentages are too high or too low because we don't have the data uh, to make that judgment and neither do the agencies or they wouldn't have had to request information after they went ahead and made their proposal, which is an interesting way to do public policy, I think. <laughs> Uh, but what we can uh, say with uh, some certainty is that whether the targets are generally right or wrong, one size won't fit all. One size won't fit all banks, and one size won't fit all communities, and one size won't fit all phases of the economic cycle. Lending is cyclical, and it needs to be, in part because demand for loans are cyclical, 
and also safety and soundness considerations uh, vary according to economic conditions. And there's really just no allowance for any of that. Um, in addition, by focusing, and, and I give them the agency's credit for saying this ratio is the CRA evaluation measure. That leaves very little uh, room for looking at the retail lending like home mortgages and small business loans. Yep. It leaves very little uh, for community development. Uh, right now, I don't think we've said this yet today, uh, about 97 or 98 percent of, of all banks are passing their CRA exams. Unless the agencies mean to dramatically yeah. increase failure rates, they're going to have to set the threshold sufficiently low uh, that they will become non-binding. And that is, uh, uh, that takes all the real juice out of CRA. I'll, I'm going to stop there. Right. <laughs> One thing you left out, Buzz, that you, you've mentioned before is even if we have these thresholds, they can be changed. Yeah, so one of the ideas here is to make this more predictable, to give uh, the banks something they can manage too. But, um, you know, the easiest thing for a successor policymaker to do is to turn the dial up or down a little bit. Oh, did we say 6% to pass and 11% out to, get to be outstanding? Nah, let's make it 3% and 5%, or let's make it 10% and 20%. It's just like a couple of keystrokes, folks. That's not even a whole big rethink. And that kind of volatility is the last thing banks need. Banks need predictability. They need to know what they're managing to. And uh, volatility and instability are a really poor policy environment for banks. Right. Let me just remind you, there are people going around collecting cards, so we will be uh, taking your questions uh, uh, for the last 15 minutes, so uh, please write them down if you have them. Does anybody else want to comment on uh, the CRA evaluation tool? Um, we've talked a little bit about what's in the numerator, so yes, Jenny. I just want to say one thing. I, can, I know I can go on forever, but I will. One thing, I just want to make really clear. Under the current CRA exam, there's something called a performance context, right? And that basically outlines what are the needs and opportunities in the community, what do, you know, they're supposed to talk to community members, it can be written by regulators or banks. And then when they evaluate a bank, they take into account comments written by community groups. Or anybody, right, it can be a banker, you know, any person from the community can write a comment letter and it's part of the exam. They have fundamentally changed that, so not only are these really arbitrary targets, they are completely disconnected to local community needs. That comes a distant second, if at all. And they took out the opportunity in the law or the regulation for somebody to write a comment about how a bank is doing. We have been looking at dollar targets for a long time at a and We think it has a value, but it is not the determinative one. You can have a bank with a huge volume where that volume is financing displacement or that volume is not getting us to what we want. It could be okay or it can be harmful, right? You, and we can write a letter and that will become part of the exam. And that's an area that we actually want strengthened. Not only, now I don't get to say, hey, you didn't listen to my comment or you didn't, take, you didn't use it enough. I can't even write a letter. I could write it, but there's no, it doesn't go in any public file. It's gone. So I can write it, you know, can put it in the New York Times, but it won't make it into any regulator's evaluation. That's a, and it's written 90% by the banks under the regulation. Now it's, you know, whoever writes it, writes it. That is not okay. <laughs> you don't get to write your own exam. Okay, go so, on. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, so uh, I, I want to focus a little bit on retail loans for a second, because I, I think it may be a little bit confusing to mm -hmm. people. So if you make mortgage loans, you're going to be judged on, uh, as I said before, some benchmarks as to whether you are uh, making sufficient number of loans, mortgage loans to low and moderate income. Um, households, um, uh, not to low and moderate income communities. They changed that. That's another little technicality here. Um, but it's important to realize also the dollar value of those go into the numerator like of the CRA evaluation me measure. So now we got, and I want to come back to the measurement of what's called the distribution test, which is 
Uh, is the bank doing enough in the locality in, in serving LMI uh, borrowers uh, or households with mortgage loans, small business loans, consumer loans? Um, but let's just talk about it in the numerator. So what does it mean that we're now going to put credit cards uh, in this numerator? And how, what, what impact does that have on some banks have lots of other kinds of products and some mm -hmm. just have small business and, and retail? Uh, uh, small business and, uh, and mortgage loans. So I think this gets to the one-size-fits-all problem. Uh, you, you know, should CRA be harder for you because you don't have a big credit card business? Uh, probably not. And, um, and so if I do have a big credit card business, should I therefore be able to pay less attention to other community needs? Probably not. So when you have um, such a excessively aggregated measure, uh, this is part of, of what you can uh, lose. Uh, also, I, I thought you were going to talk a little bit about the retail distribution test. Well, let's go to that. Test okay, too, sure. because there are some issues there. So there are certain benchmarks uh, that banks are supposed to hit. For example, um, in order to pass a retail uh, distribution measure for, say, home mortgages or small businesses, you, the proposal says uh, the share of your home mortgage lending to low and moderate income borrowers should be at least 65% of uh, the share that uh, banks generally are providing to low and moderate income. So, in its pass fail. So all I have to do is hit 65% of what everybody else is doing. So I'm going to aim for that 65%. I may even aim for 70 or 75% just to be sure. And everybody else is going to do the same thing. This is what defines a race to the bottom, right? So if there were a more uh, fully rated retail lending distribution analysis, where it's not just pass-fail, but uh, there could be outstanding or even high satisfactory ratings for doing more than the minimum, uh, that would push, and, and if that rating was then fully considered alongside of the total dollar volume that we've been talking about, that would motivate me as a bank to try to do as well as I could there. Um, so th this is a, a, a big problem. And there's one irony that uh, Mark just drove by and waved at quickly, but I, I want to just uh, stress it. When CRA was first uh, advocated for and then passed in 1977, the driving problem that motivated advocates to seek CRA was redlining. They were frustrated that going to the local bank, and in those days it often was a local bank, and saying, my kid grew up in this neighborhood, uh, is now ready to buy their first home, and have the bank say, oh, sorry, we're not lending in that neighborhood anymore. So lending to, of, to mortgages in low and moderate income neighborhoods was, among all the other drivers, the pulse that drove towards CRA. Because we all know what happens if you starve communities of capital. That is no longer part of this proposal. They will not look at home mortgage lending in low and moderate income neighborhoods. Does that mean that problem has gone away forever? No, I don't think so. Other comments on the retail pass-fail here? Yeah. Then, then we're going to move on to the internet. And then, I, um, yeah. again, uh, submit your question, please. A couple of things. Um, I was looking at data on New York City, and we had like roughly 8 to 10 percent of all home loans, one to four family, go to LMI borrowers today. So that means the bar is like 
six to six to seven percent that you have to meet because nobody's going to meet the demographic comparator, right? By CRA standards, about seventy percent of New York City is LMI. Um, You're a little bit too far in the weeds. You have so a choice of what's there were two different choices under this exam right. for your pass fail. Thank you. One is to look at what's the population of low and moderate income people. And yes, I know New York City is rarely an assessment area; it's larger, but. For my world, it's New York City. Um, and so then you have to meet 55% of that demographic comparator. So if 70% of the city is LMI, then half of that is, what, 35? So 40% would have to be, of your loans, would have to go to LMI borrowers. Do any banks in here make 40% of your loans to LMI borrowers? No. Um, so that's one thing. So they're not, nobody's going to meet that. Nobody's going to do that bar. So the next bar is what are your peers doing? So depending on if you include non-banks or banks, it's like 8 to 10% of New York City loans go to LMI borrowers. And this is if you look at everything, right? If you look at home purchase versus refinance versus home improvement, you might get variations. But because I'm assuming they're lumping it all together, you have to do 65% of that. So if 10% of our loans go to low and moderate income borrowers, you have to make 6.5% of your loans. First of all, this is a really low bar to reach. However, Half of the banks don't meet it, including you know, some pretty, pretty large banks. So to Buzz's point, are they going to fail half of them? That would be kind of an interesting dynamic. I'm not convinced that's going to happen. So now you get your performance context. Oh, well, you see, it's a really high cost market. This is all the reasons why we couldn't make it. And you have two choices. One, you could try to make it, and then maybe bring the bar down, as Buzz was saying. Or you could say, you know what, forget it. New York City is way too hard particularly for the large banks that have like some 500 to 800 assessment areas, which I know is not the case for some of the smaller banks, of course, but for the larger banks that have the means to do this and do it well, not make any loan, they can be like, forget it, I'll pass in the other half of my assessment areas, because you only have to pass in half of your assessment areas, which I know we'll get to later. And, but I'll still do my deals in New York because I have this one ratio to reach. I have a bank level assessment. Remember those 6%, 11% thresholds? Still got to do that at the bank level. That's my determinative goal. So I'm going to do the big deal in New York City. I'm going to do the flashy deal. I'm going to do, we have opportunity zones here too, you know. And I'm going to do all that. I'll meet my target, but I'm not going to worry about putting my time into like affordable home mortgages because I'm never going to meet it. And I'm likely not even going to meet that goal for some of the banks. You know, we have banks with large deposit bases that may not even make it to 6%. So that's a lot of work to get there. Why don't I do it in an area that's easier, but still do my big deals, because you know can't ignore New York, and I want to get to my big dollar, do dollar targets. It's absurd. And then the last thing, um, I'm seeing folks in the Bronx here and other areas that have been disinvested in for years. We don't look at, we talked about one to four family loans, the redlining. Redlining also included multifamily buildings, right? So now you don't have to loan any multi, they don't look at multifamily. You don't have to lend in LMI tracks. We have this awesome new law that it protects tenants everywhere. So now banks can't make money by you know, kicking out as many tenants, but they can reduce maintenance. And you know, they have, so now landlords have let, are going to be doing everything they can to try to. Banks don't make money by kicking out tenants. Let's just be. Banks like, finance <laughs> landlords that kick out tenants. So there's a direct connection. <laughs> be, clear, be clear yeah. about that. Better stated. Um, but they can also do the right thing, and they can have responsible lending criteria, and the CRA has fostered that. But now, under this proposal, banks don't have to make mortgages in the Bronx. Right. That is hugely problematic. <laughs> That's it. Good, bad, or otherwise. Right. <laughs> that I, the LMI I, right. test affects that. Too. So I want to un underline um, the point that <clears throat> I think is being made here, which is the rules are completely changing. Yeah. And when you completely change the rules, you have no idea whether the banks, what they do now, will qualify. But you can rest assured, I can tell you having worked for a bank, they do not like flunking regulatory exams. It's just not part of what banks do. And so they will do whatever they have to to meet whatever the criteria are. And if that's a completely different strategy than they have now, that's probably what they're going to do because any smart executive is going to say, I got a pass. Right. And these are the rules. Right. So I, I rules think you're just hearing <laughs> yeah. how these rules can completely transform the way yeah. banks will even deal uh, with CRA. And that has implications, as you said, for, yeah. for, for the communities. So um, you did mention, somebody else want to comment on this? I just yeah. want to comment sure. on the numerator. And just in terms of what, what okay. counts in the context of you know, a, a real community. So yeah. t the proposal says that. Um, 
any investment in an opportunity zone would mm -hmm. count. And uh, all of Southeast Queens is an opportunity zone. <laughs> And so that means that you know luxury rental housing projects yep. would count, and self storage would count, mm -hmm. and these uh, stadiums would count. And if you're trying to you know race to the bottom, and get your numerator very large with doing fewer transactions, that's what you will do. Yeah. Since um, you, you raised it, hope on um, um, what counts in the numerator. I think there are a couple of other. Um, very problematic things that count and that could really distract from the core of community reinvestment. For one thing, infrastructure counts without regard to low and moderate income benefit as long as low and moderate income people are not excluded from the uh, using the infrastructure. So financing an interstate <laughs> Uh, will count as long as there's no sign that says no low and moderate income drivers uh, are permitted. Um, that's a huge, um, I don't know what word to use other than loophole. Uh, a, a, a second is um, the purchase of uh, mortgage-backed securities. Now, the good news is the beneficiaries of those low and moderate income uh, mortgages in those mortgage-backed securities uh, are low and moderate income people, or uh, and, and that that's helpful. But uh, this is the maybe the most liquid uh, credit market outside of sovereign debt uh, in the world. It's almost eight trillion dollars of uh, MBS backed by Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, or uh, Ginny Mae. So it comes with full guarantees. And um, you don't need to have a staff uh, of community development experts to do that. You just need a Bloomberg terminal. Uh, and by the way, uh, you don't have to even hold very much capital. In the case of Ginny Mays, you don't have to hold any capital at all to support that. So from a return on capital perspective, which is something that many banks care about, uh, this is really a dominant choice. And the risk is that it crowds out the good stuff. So, um, uh, Jamie, I just want to pick up here. Uh, you mentioned here about 50%. Um, I'm yeah. not sure we're going to get to it. So I, I just want to mention, in order for your national uh, overall bank um, yeah. rating to get an outstanding or a satisfactory, then you only need 50% of your assessment areas to have gotten and outstanding or satisfactory. Yeah. So you literally could ignore, yeah. I'm sure no banks would do it that extreme, but it does change, again, uh, yeah. um, how banks might view where to, uh, where to prioritize. Exactly. Uh, where, where to put yep. it. So I, I want to, um, if it's okay, uh, <clears throat> before we open it up, which we're gonna do in a minute or two, uh, let's talk about internet banking. So this is, <clears throat> this is definitely a big motivator here. <laughs> so we have banks that, literally have no deposit taking facilities. They sit in Salt Lake City mm -hmm. or um, some probably sit in New York, uh, yeah. uh, uh, Wilmington, mm -hmm. Delaware, um, North Dakota, North Dakota. Sorry, South Dakota. South Carolina, South, yeah. Right, yeah. there are a number of places yeah. that have very favorable tax laws yeah. uh, for banks and so they situate mm -hmm. those uh, institutions. Yeah. And there has been, um, a lack of clarity about uh, uh, what to do with these banks. Uh, some of them are what are called wholesale banks and have no retail products, but right. you'll have a now an internet bank, internet bank that just does mortgages, so clearly yeah. retail yeah. Uh, products. Right. And so there's a whole question now about uh, how do we give more certainty, more clarity uh, to the regulation. Um, banks are allowed to do what's called a strategic plan, and some of them have done that. So they've basically come up with their own rules, and the regulator said, fine, those are good cri criteria. But um, let's talk a little bit about how internet banks are dealt with in this uh, proposal here. Internet retail banks, yeah. in particular. Do you want to yeah. comment on that, Jamie? I will try. <laughs> basically, they have this threshold of like where you get 5% of your deposits. Um, so the, the smallest geographic area where you collect 5% of your deposits. 
So that could be New York City or it could be New York State. And I've heard anecdotally that for some banks it actually could end up being at a state level, which is not a really local obligation. So I'm glad they're looking at this. I don't think this quite gets at it. Um, I don't know that banks necessarily know exactly where all their deposits come from, although I'm actually not opposed to having that information. I think that's important. But it doesn't look at where you're doing business, like where you're making loans, where you're making credit card loans, where you're making home loans, like your business. It doesn't right. look at that. It strictly looks at where you're taking deposits. So that's a major flaw in it. And the idea of it, I believe, was to try to help underbanked areas. Um, personally, I think that if a bank is doing a lot of business in a certain area, be it New York City or a rural area, there should be an obligation to do so equitably, right? And to make sure that you're doing, like looking at that distribution. But this is also an opportunity to get capital into underserved areas. So this is where I don't like to do rural versus urban. It also really bothers me when they say that New York City is so overbanked that we can just, you know, give out money elsewhere because we know that it's not being distributed equitably in New York City, and that's a huge problem. But we shouldn't be pitting one against the other. So I think this is a missed opportunity to have that conversation in a meaningful way amongst internet banks and also right. Right. Right, you know, banks with branches that may not have branches in rural areas that do need capital. So I don't think this gets at the problem they're trying to solve. There was a conversation about credit deserts, right? There mm -hmm, are parts absolutely. of the country that are not getting any yeah. CRA mm -hmm. yeah. activity. Exactly. And um, I don't know that the idea was yeah. maybe this reform would, would help that. So Maybe some other parts. I mean, having your one ratio everywhere could get, you know, capital into an area that doesn't have access. And, you know, that's that piece of it is not terrible, but I don't want it to come at the expense of the local obligation. But that's not what you're asking about here. So okay. I, I, I'd like well, go, to make two ahead. quick points on, on this. First is, um, I, I, I agree that there needs to be a better way to, to take a look in the modern and emerging world of banking of what banks are doing in the, beyond the places where they actually have branches, right? Because so much of the world is going to the internet. And that, that's totally the right problem to address. But there's a, two problems. One is, generally speaking, deposits follow where people are, right? So where are the places that are going to generate at least 5% of an internet bank's deposits? They're New York, LA, the state of Illinois, the state of Florida, the state of Texas, and maybe a couple of other places. It's not every place else, so it's very uneven. Yeah. And um, you know, if you've got the entire state of Texas, does that mean you're really penetrating to inner city San Antonio or yeah. rural um, hill country? I doubt it. Um, so that's one problem. But the other problem is that it's just the wrong paradigm. Yeah. It, it looks at these internet banks and imagines them as if they were a gazillion local community banks on the ground in every part of the country. And that's just not what they are. They don't, they don't exist any place physical, right? And so to impose this sort of, the same local template that is appropriate for branch-based banks is a, just the wrong way to think about it. We should be thinking about are you helping low and moderate income people in places on a fair and equitable basis? That should be the question for those internet banks. And this proposal just doesn't get at that because it misconstrues who they are. So we have some great questions from the audience. So I uh, hope, I guess, people uh, want to give you a chance here uh, to once again uh, <clears throat> lead off. Um, so you hosted um, Controller Auditing in Jamaica as part of his listening tour. Mm -hmm. What do you wish he had heard? Do you have a way to communicate <laughs> with him on um, your concerns? Have you heard from him since? I have not heard from him since. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I did think that he heard that, you know, Southeast Queens was a banking desert. He did yes. acknowledge that, so I will say that. But. What he did not hear was that um, this um, working with banks as a community development entity 
is uh, a relationship. And I think banks understand what the sort of needs and aspirations of the community are. And so under this current context, we're able to um, work with lenders to drive investment to where they're needed most. And I think he really didn't hear that. Right, right. Um, so, uh, I, <clears throat> the OCC is out there with the FDIC. I got them to go along. Um, the Fed uh, did not join. What are the implications uh, of, of that if this uh, uh, remains the situation? Con confusion. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I mean, I think that, that um, uh, what uh, Mr. Odding frequently uh, underlines is that um, the OCC and the FDIC um, uh, regulate the majority of um, uh, CRA uh, um, banks, um, like 85 percent, um, mm -hmm. I think, is the, the number that he uses. And so, um, uh, you know, like some of us got this lovely little video um, uh, encouraging us to, to comment and sort of underscoring um, how important um, uh, those regulators are. But it does matter that the Federal Reserve is not on board. And um, you know, this possibility of, you know, sort of continued negotiations where all three regulators end up in the same place, but there's also the possibility that, um, you know, you're going to have different sets of, of rules for um, different banks, which is confusing for the banks and, um, you know, very confusing for, you know, the community folks that are, that are trying to, to, to work with them. So um, I think that that's going to be a bad outcome. Well, a lot of people not, may not realize that actually some state bank regulators also That's have true. CRA rules. Yeah. New York yeah. State yeah. has yeah. its own law. Um, anybody want to speculate how this would play out if you have the national regulators not in agreement here? You're gonna uh, have what might happen? And yeah. might more states actually um, put in place their own laws or all localities? Because there's been a lot of push for that as well. It, there's that, and yeah. also banks under with 500 million get a pass on have the option of opting into this new right. system, or they could stay with the old system. Right. So, mm -hmm. so yeah. a lot of uncertainty, um, and an uncertainty is rarely good mm -hmm. for um, uh, banks making decisions to, uh, you know, sort of increase their community development um, activities. So some of the state regulators try to align their policies with the federal policies. Um, the challenge is, though, that, and, and these apply to state chartered banks, really, because uh, the national banks uh, are sort of excused from having to follow the state uh, rules on this. But some of those state chartered banks are Fed supervised, others are FDIC supervised. So I suppose the state agencies could say, well, we'll have two sets of rules so that they can align with uh, whoever the supervisor is of a given bank. But that seems awfully cumbersome. Jimmy? So far, New York State has been pushing back and has been strong against this. Please keep that up. <laughs> um, but what that means is that you know state charter banks could actually have two completely different regimes under which the same bank is being evaluated yeah. under. And that's just really absurd and going to be it's going to be problematic um, for a lot of reasons. I don't know which one is going to take higher precedence. Like, there's a lot of uncertainty. And one thing I want to highlight, um, the $500 million threshold, my understanding is that if you're under it, you get to use the small bank test. Is that correct? Like yes. the, so try to do this not getting in the weeds. But there's small bank, intermediate, small, and large. <laughs> right. And this intermediate <clears throat> is $330 million up to the $1.2 billion. Now. Now, today. today. That matters. Those are the ones that are probably investing in a lot of CDFIs, right? There, NCRC actually did a study. I don't remember the statistic exactly, but there's a lot of money coming from these intermediate small banks. And if that goes away, not only do we have different regimes, but now you have fewer banks with a community development obligation, which means m less money. So any of those banks that opt out, a number of them will fall under that, will fall within that threshold, right? Between 330 and 500 million. I don't, know what, I don't know what that's going to mean for the community, but it's going to be a loss. So in the midst of all of this right. bigger picture, um, 
I just want to highlight that right. nuance. There, um, there was a brief time when the Office of Thrift Supervision, which doesn't exist anymore, doesn't <coughs> had a separate <laughs> race, and it was a disaster. It was a disaster for a lot uh, of reasons. For that. <laughs> and I, I'm, probably a lot of people in the audience don't realize, the FDIC um, regulates banks that get deposit insurance. So all yeah. banks get yeah. that. So they regulate all yeah. banks. The Fed, uh, the OCC regulates national banks, Correct. and the Fed um, uh, bank holding companies. Uh, and then you have the state banks. We actually have banks that are uh, that are uh, chartered by the by the state here, mm -hmm. and the FDIC obviously is both of them. Uh, uh, oversees them as FDIC well. And so there's both of them. So you there's yeah. been a lot of shopping for regulators, and there's all sorts of uh, there's worry about things that, that are, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. are crazy separate from this. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, this yeah. probably makes it a little bit uh, <sighs> more more crazy. Um, so Jamie has mentioned that. Uh, one necessary change to the CRA's regulation is to enable regulators to downgrade banks when they contribute to displacement. Mm -hmm. What would new regulations that hold banks accountable uh, for something, gentrification and displacing low income look like? Mm -hmm. um, right. So we have a set of best practices for banks to follow, so that would be a first step, which means responsible underwriting. I'm talking about multifamily tenant displacement. So lending to the tenants who live there and the real estate maintenance costs. Just make sure you're lending to the people that live there, not to some future tenant that could pay more rent. That's fundamental. But then two other pieces of it are evaluate the record of the landlord, right? So does this landlord have a record of displacement? And you can get that from any number of sources. But you can also look at what's happening to tenants in those buildings and in buildings owned by this landlord. Uh, vacancy, um, evictions, disp um, people moving out, conditions. Are they contributing to poor conditions, which can either lead to people living in really awful conditions or having to move because it's so unbearable, neither of which is a good solution. And I'm not talking about one or two bad loans, right? I'm talking about a pattern. And we've seen this over and over again, where banks continue to lend to certain landlords that have a public record of displacement and harm. And that should count against you. If you know all this is going on, you've talked to tenants, and now you're still lending um, or lending without any obligation on that landlord. You can get into that nuance, right? If you're still lending and you've put conditions in place that this landlord has to improve their behavior, great, right? So are you being a responsible? Are you, so instead of saying, to push back, right, banks aren't displacing tenants, feel like you're displacing tenants because that's your obligation. If you're putting money on a building, you should have the same obligation as that landlord to make sure those tenants are protected. Otherwise, you're complicit. And I want regulators to take that seriously. So you've negotiated with some banks mm -hmm. for... Yeah. Um, and to what degree has CRA been a factor in the? It was work? a key factor in one um, in one bank, New York Community Bank. It was in the process of a merger. They were combining two of their entities together, and that opened up an opportunity to come up with a CRA pledge, and that led to um, a commitment to best practices as well as some mm -hmm. other other um, obligations that they put forward or commitments. And then with Signature Bank. That one we took to the streets. It was a long-term campaign, and in the end, they were applying to open up a branch, where, and when you open up a new branch, CRA is a factor. And so that helped kind of push it over the edge. Right. So I'm going to do one more question and then give you a sort of, a, a sort of lightning round for final statements. If there's something we haven't covered, there are lots of topics I know we haven't, uh, if you want to uh, uh, raise them. Th this raises a, um, a conceptual uh, question in my mind about what can you accomplish with the Community Reinvestment Act? How broad should it be? So the concept of community development has evolved to include environmental sustainability and climate resilience. Is resilience and sustainability eligible act activities? If not, why not? Mm -hmm. And I would add, should it? I think there's really a very simple answer to these seemingly difficult questions, and that is, to what extent does it benefit low and moderate people and places? If, cl if climate resiliency uh, is done in a way that benefits low and moderate income people in places, absolutely it should be part of CRA. And if it doesn't, I'd say, well, that's a great thing to do, but it isn't CRA. Okay. Same goes, by the way, for child care. Is child care really important in, in America? It is. Should banks get credit for financing right. child care for upper income people in places? No. Okay, last word going down the line here. Hope you want to take a shot at that, or shall I start the? I'll start with Jennifer. <laughs> <laughs> ah, right, shocking. <laughs> shocking. 
So the deadline is April 8th for submitting comments. Um, there are any number of um, resources from the, the groups up here or elsewhere. Um, uh, and I, I, I encourage um, anyone um, um, with, with an interest in this subject to consider um, submitting a, a comment to the OCC and FDIC. Um, right. That's my last word. It does? I, I think that's good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, Jamie? Just remember that the CRA was in response to redlining and systematic discrimination, which still persists. So anything that we do on CRA really has to have that in mind. There's a lot of great things in this world that banks can work on, and you can, but just remember what CRA is meant to do. And is it helping lift people out of poverty and move people to build wealth and assets in a way that's responsible for the community? That's where it has to focus on. And yes, please submit comments. We have sample comments on our website. You can go to anhd.org, and I'm happy to answer questions and help provide talking points if you need it. And lastly, I would, I would echo that we should submit comments. You know, CRA is like inside baseball for most people, and I've been yeah. going out and telling people what this really means for their communities, and I think to the extent that we can spread the word, it's very important. All right. Well, a fabulous panel. I couldn't do that. Let's talk to them. All right, whether you're going home or going to work, write that comment. Let it <laughs>